Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. In today's episode, we've got John from Goonhammer joining us as we talk about Kill Team Nightmare. So we're here to talk about the big news of the weekend with uh, my co-author on Goonhammer, John. Oh, uh, hey guys. Here to talk about (laughs) Night Lords and uh, Mandrakes? All only (laughs) spooky things on this podcast today. Uh, uh, Yep. It's It's the Halloween special early. Congratulations, everyone. Yeah, just a bunch of uh, surprising dudes popping out of the shadows, say hello with a knife, send you back into the shadow realm. Yeah, I mean, um, I've been watching some of the conversations. It seems like a lot of people are worried that these two teams are going to break the game. What do you fellas think? First impressions, are they going to just destroy everything or are they going to just kind of splash around and be fine and dandy? I think JD came in way safer than I did, so I'll let, I'll let, I'll let JD start. Okay, um, yeah, I have opinions, so... I, as me and me and Travis uh, for full view uh, wrote the Goonhammer review for Night Lords, uh, yeah, uh, Travis is super pumped on them, and I'm not gonna. They are a very good team. Uh, I don't think anyone who is a fan of the Night Lords will be disappointed with this rule set. Um, I, I come down a little hard on their faction rule, which is kind of bland when you compare it to what the Mandrakes get. Uh, but is, if you're a fan of Chaos Space Marines, they can do all the cool, all the stuff Legionnaires can do. They take a slight durability and lethality hit, but they get a bunch of fun tricks to make up for it. So that's, that's the best way to put it. Um, Mandrakes, uh, like all elf teams, have a number of things that will probably infuriate the other players. And half for half, uh, and I'm sure uh, John from Can You Roll a Crit has been, we'll, we'll be talking about this too. A potentially game-breaking ability, especially on close quarter. Um, but overall, both rules are fantastic. They're also, I would say, above average strength. Uh, Night Lords definitely have an edge up on their elite counterparts uh, and kind of, I think, lead the way in terms of what we would like to see out of elite teams going forward to help them kind of match up with the more numerous teams. Mandrakes will probably infuriate some people, depending on the matchup. And then run into a brick wall when they run into something like Geller Pox that can really tank their bullshit. Uh, so that's kind of my takeaway. What about you, Travis? Me and Jason actually played a couple games, just uh, like practice games with the pair of teams. And I came away feeling far safer on the Mandrakes than I had thought while reading the rules. I think while reading the rules, you just kind of bake in that every time a rule says you are within shadow, that it's just always on. And it's very easy to read the rules like, yeah, I'm just going to always be in shadow. Why would I not be in shadow? But like a good opponent will just stand in the open and force you to come to them. And then when you charge them, your weapons are just four or five lethal five, which is not a good break point. Like you'll two shot all the seven wound operatives, but then you're just standing in the open getting shot. So the Mandrakes end up feeling much safer, I think, than they look on paper, because I think when I read them, they looked broken. But I came away from the Night Lord's rules being like ah this team is going to be a big problem because they have all the tools that i think elites need to scrim against all the teams and i think they kind of dunk on everyone except for maybe custodies as far as like the elites go just because the elites like custodies just out elite them so hard that even with the extra activations the custodies if they touch you 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 still die what about you jason how are you feeling about them um well <clears throat> the direct comparison with the Nemesis Claw to Legionary, um, like playing a, a lot of elites lately, um, the, I'm always looking for something that gets you slightly better action economy. So like regular Legionary has the aspiring champion that can do free actions when he kills dudes. And um, you got the Mark of Zinch that lets you take extra actions. Um, and Night Lords don't really have anything like that. Um, but the tricks they do have are very powerful. Um, so it is like fundamentally like a different way to play um the the prescience is super cool 
Um, I mean, I just, my first impression, like, the first couple games that I'm going to do with them is probably just going to be five flayed skin for equipment. Because it's simple and just, like, turning people's rerolls off, like, means even your people that aren't amazing in melee, people really, like, don't want to risk just raw dice trying to fight a space marine. Yeah, and that Skinner model on the on the Night Lords is like extremely brutal. If he kills someone and someone else sees him do it, you're like, oh, that guy's just worthless for a whole turning point, which is kind of like a two for one for free. And it's very hard to stay out of a six inch range while he does it. So I feel like Night Lords are going to be one of the better, better elite teams, if not the best elite team when they come out, if people can use all of the things that make them good. Because while, you know, JD is right, their special rule is not that interesting. It does give you new approaches that you didn't have before. Because now you can walk up underneath a piece of Octarius and just be on Spooky. And people are like, oh no, there is an elite there. I can't shoot him. They're just like, so it just gives you new approaches that I think could be valuable. Yeah, the in Midnight Clad, I think actually solves a lot of the problems that I had trying to do all, me- all melee legionary. Um, just because it's really, really hard not to get shot on turn one. But I feel like that'd be a lot easier with the in Midnight Clad special rule. Yeah, you can stage, I think, basically like seven inches away from anything important, hiding in and around Shadow. And if you can set that up on Conceal, then on turn two, your opponents now either have to move up to shoot you, which is not great for you, but you've got a three up save and maybe that's fine. But if they try to do that, you Vox Scream them and you punch them in the face. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the reason I found in Midnight Clad so underwhelming was that it was kind of the inverse of the Shadow rule that mandrakes get where the night lords have to satisfy all the criteria to benefit while mandrakes kind of just have to do one of yeah, them mandrakes and that was a kind very of... flexible activation but it's because all of their power is tied up on whether or not they are in shadow whereas midnight clad is like a boost to survivability that just kind of like floats around but you i you're right it does feel weird when you read the pair of rules together you're like why is it that this only gives you obscurity and it feels like I have to do all this work and it's almost trivial on the mandrakes. To be fair, you have to be around heavy cover. So on open, it's not everything that it works around. And then on in the dark, mandrakes feel like they are extremely powerful because you can just always be around heavy. Yeah, and like in Midnight Clad works with light cover as well. <clears throat> so it's basically like super conceal. Um, and then you can just kind of be like standing sort of out in the open where it looks like you should be a really easy shot. But if it's from beyond six, you're going to be obscured. You still have to be under. Uh, it's like actually, within on. one inch of any kind of cover, light or heavy. Um, and with a conceal order and the enemies more than six away. So you could really just like stand next to a barricade without it getting in your way to slow down your charge at all. And as long as your enemies are <clears throat> outside of six inches you can just like stand there safely and then that is kind of like the answer to get those longer charges because you don't have to go around stuff you just stand next to it yeah jason i think you got a good point it does it does allow the nemesis claw to do a very decisionary and from uh vox the vox scream yeah vox uh, scream is the delay one they can go into turning point two very strong even if they don't have the initiative and if they do have the initiative uh, they could potentially gut their opponent if their opponent has been too aggressive moving forward to meet them. So that is something people will have to watch. I think it will take people by surprise at first. Yeah, and then yeah, I'm pretty... also looking at the team, <clears throat> it kind of looks to me like the melee build is, is, I mean, it draws, it works for me better because of that safer approach. And then kind of the same thing that Assault Intercessors had going on, where your your five dice on threes with four damage a pop is going to more reliably kill stuff. Whereas if you're like trying to like run up and, and like even like shoot someone with a plasma gun, like they don't have like native rerolls unless someone's injured. And, and it's just like they don't really have anything that synergizes with their shooting that well. They don't have veteran to long war. <coughs> so it's kind of like most of their their like killy synergy is in the melee realm. So um that's kind of another like crazy thing um, that I wasn't like 100% expecting, but thinking about it for, you know, uh, a decent chunk of time. And I was like, I think that's the build for it. And I guess I realized that, you know, we kind of jumped ahead of ourselves in case any of our listeners haven't decided to go look at all the rules and read our articles on Goonhammer and watch Can Your Old Crits video. You know, in Midnight Clad requires you to have a conceal order be within one inch of heavier light terrain and have any part of your base underneath a vantage point and be more than six inches away. While 
within shadow on the mandrakes is i think you have to be within an inch of heavy terrain specifically or be underneath a vantage point and i think that's basically it. or or within a, a shadow token if i remember correctly yes the inch of the shadow portal mm-hmm. uh that the one operative can make um yeah that's one of those three criteria is all they require yeah and all the mandrakes basically unlock every single operative and half of their rules are based around whether or not you're touching shadow there there is definitely boards that they would struggle on uh i could see once they have to basically get onto the vantage points of beta decima uh they can find themselves in a bad spot um or just certain octarius setups where everyone knows the one where there's you're going to find a objective that's sitting in the open, and the only way to defend it is to put a little barricade on it. Now, I think they do get equipment that gives operative super conceal. Super conceal, which, yeah, for two equipment points. Which, so there is a way to mitigate that, but that what they do have good equipment, and you're going to be probably spinning it on that super conceal to make up for any of the weaknesses the team finds itself in board setups. Yeah, they are. They've got pretty flexible equipment, which I think is nice, but. Ultimately, they're nine nine operative team with eight wounds, living on a five up invuln or a four up invuln if you're in shadow. So staying in shadow is going to be basically like the most important thing. If you ever leave shadow with the mandrakes, your opponent better have been chipped already because otherwise you are basically wasting your time. Even though you've got pretty okay shooting because you're only ever shooting at people basically at minus one whatever their normal save profile is. <laughs> I was gonna say you're walk you're rocking team wide bolters basically with uh, the equivalent of AP one against uh, elite teams and nothing really against uh, more horde based teams, uh, but you do have a way to to boost damage against a single target thanks to the abyssal. But other than that, yes, they're they're at the mercy and they can never double shoot. I don't think they can ever double fight, and they don't have any APL modification either. So that is they've got the one. Put, Oh, they do? Um, They've got the Chooser of Flesh. So, like, the most important operative on the entire Mandrake's team is they have one melee operative called the Chooser of Flesh, and if he gets a kill, he steals a soul, and then someone else can eat the soul. And if they eat the soul, they either heal for D6, which is fine, but, you know, that's not what we're here for, or you can add an APL to an operative. And I think at the moment, you could theoretically do this over two separate turning points and add four like have someone go to four apl there's nothing that in it that says it caps it at three because you're increasing the apl like characteristic characteristic. yeah i don't think there's anything that stops you from going to four at the moment i don't know if that's what they wanted but it is very cool if you kill a marine they're worth two souls but when we've played the team if you didn't get a kill with the chooser the team feels very kind of miserable and i think it's a very similar problem to hand of the archon where they feel very good, but they have no comms. So if you ever are not able to get something that your opponent doesn't want you to get, you're playing a fair game with 18 APL, which is just very, it's just tough. But yeah. the Mandrakes have the ability to steal a soul forever and turn your team into like two mini marines yeah. or one mini marine, which is, that's definitely the most important operative on the team. And if he doesn't get his kill, generally I think the game is going to be kind of impossible for them, is what it feels like. Just because you don't have enough raw stats to really beat other people, even though all of your stats are pretty okay. There's just nothing that feels unfair until you get to 3 APL so you can, like, charge fight, soul blast someone else, steal a point. Yeah, I mean, it do- it does kind of feel like <clears throat> um, they're gonna have the same problem that Harlequins had been having, where, like, uh, they're gonna they're gonna feel tough to fight against for, like, if someone is really good at Mandrakes and they're playing against newer players, they're gonna have, you know, a nightmare. Uh, but then, like, once they get to the top tables, it's kind of like you can just stand somewhere where they don't have any corners to hide in and just take points and blast people and it's totally fine or just like run up and shoot them point blank and and like just like pure aggression kind of just like they don't really have anything to like slow your roll if you try to do that yeah they're they're a much frailer team than i think they look like they've got the ability to heal in combat they've got a lot of tricks but a lot of them require you to stay in cut like in shadow so while it is like creeping horror is probably one of their craziest strategic ploys. And it basically says every time your enemy activates, you can take one mandrake that's concealed and in shadow and you can have them dash as long as they end up within shadow. So everyone on your team can take a free dash as long as they stay within shadow, which sounds crazy good. But if you imagine most open boards, the first piece of heavy terrain you're around just lets you kind of like 
phase around it, but it doesn't let you go anywhere because you can't leave the shadow to another spot because generally the next piece of heavy is not three inches away or four inches away with your equipment. It's like six inches away. So you're just kind of like, you're just like phasing back and forth between like a thing. Or if it's something you can get to, it's the only thing they can get to. So do you want to bunch up a thing, you know, half your team on that one spot and then get vaporized by a grenade or something like that, which uh, with four up invuln saves in shadow, if you don't have shadow, you're you're in deep shit. You don't have the feel no pains like your uh, hand of the Arkham brethren. Uh, yeah, they will they will evaporate just like any other elf team, maybe quicker than other elf teams uh, if you play anywhere incorrectly with them. Yeah, they're definitely they definitely read very powerful, very cool. I do think that they're a team that feels the loss of having extra bonus operatives probably more than I've seen in recent recent memory. Like the fact that you are forced to take four kind of like goons that just kind of do the same thing as everyone else is kind of weird. But I guess those four dudes are like the suicide squad that chips people away for all of your special operatives to go do the rest of the work. But it's definitely like a it from a couple games. It feels like there's a lot to remember. And then I feel like they're not necessarily better than where Void Dancers were. But Void Dancers are also worse than where they were, so maybe maybe it's fine. Yeah, I think it's going to take a while for people to like crack the code and play them well. <clears throat> and they're, I don't think their win rate at first is going to be that high. Um, and like a lot of their tools are so like unusual, it's going to take a lot of practice games. Like um, the uh, the tools they have to mess up your activation order because they've got the one dude that can like eyeball somebody super hard and then like he can go before them um and then is it is it your leader that has the aura the uh, leader has harrowing whispers yeah one of like the craziest abilities yeah uh, do you have that pulled up and can like read that off yeah it's pretty bananas so harrowing whispers is the mandrake night fiend's main ability and definitely like probably one of the craziest abilities i think they've given to an operative especially against two apl operatives so it says each time your opponent would activate a ready enemy operative within six of this operative, you can roll 1d6. If the result is greater than the enemy operative's APL, they cannot activate in this activation. If there are any other, if there are no other enemy operatives el- eligible to be activated, this ability has no effect. So basically you can like slingshot your Night Fiend close to a bunch of dorks, and then you just play the casino every time your opponent tries to activate anyone in the bubble. So I think when we were trying it, we had three Marines trying to activate around the Night Fiend, and the one Marine failed for three activations and then got killed. Yeah, because it was like, I had like my whole team clustered around because I like wasn't thinking about that at all. I think we like talked about it a little bit, and I was like, I'm going to activate this guy, and you're like, roll off. No, you're not. I was like, I'm going to activate this guy, and then it was like, roll off. No, you're not. I was like, I'm going to activate this guy, and it's like, roll off. No, you're not. It was like three in a row, and I was like, I guess I'll just activate the other guy that I just don't Yeah, we're like, we went to the entire other end of the map, which was hilarious. So if you you go, what if you go through your whole team? And Uh, then then, then it does not. It says that around to the start. It says that uh, if no other enemy operatives are eligible to be activated, then you ignore it. So like, but it's pretty funny though, because like, imagine like a the vet guard. You're like, oh no, there's like six dudes around this night fiend, and none of them activate until who knows how long it's going to take for you to do anything useful in that bubble. Which is hilarious, but it also feels like kind of insane as a conceptual ability to give an operative. <clears throat> I think that's probably going to be like the centerpiece around the most like abusive and feels bad strategies. Um, but yeah. like, I'm not mad about it yet. We'll we'll see how that shakes out after getting some more games in. Especially because Mandrix have one of the more cool equipment of taking an objective and giving everybody minus one APL around it. So if you happen to do that and you set up your your Mandrick Night Fiend leader and he runs over there, it's like, all right, you got to roll. I got to roll a one. Otherwise, you can't activate. <laughs> I, the the obvious play around is people will activate 6.1 inches away from him and yeah. then come in and try yeah. to screw him up there. It, it's a very interesting ability. Uh, I, it's like all their abilities. It's good. Like I, I'm trying to think of a single thing that's under the rule set where I'm like, oh, this is this is pointless. Uh, uh, the, the worst thing about they, them is just the the elf fragility. You know, like they might have all the elf tricks in the world, but at the end of the day, eight wounds means you can't make really any mistakes. And like they can heal, but you only heal once a turn, and it's not a guarantee. Like it's not a guarantee of a lot of health because it's 
the number of times you struck an opponent in a fight times uh excess is it like times their apl or something i think it's the number of times multiplied by the apl yeah so if you hit right. someone twice and then you kill a f- two apl operative you gain four four wounds back which is good um but it's just there's only so much healing to go around so Elites, yeah, at least for me, feel like that's where Mandrakes feel like they'll have an issue, because as good as their shooting is, it's not really going to take down an Elite, because Elites are not going to give you three Mandrakes worth of shooting on turn one normally. And then by the time they hit you, it's too late, because they, they two-shot you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do think, like, Mandrakes in general are kind of, like, stealthy, stealthily, like, one of the best shooting teams in the game, because having, like, that much three-up shooting all at once, and then also the fact that it's all worsens it like it inverses it worsens your save. the save characteristic yeah <clears throat> um so it, it like worsens their saves they hit on threes it's three four and then your gunner is flexible because then you can just have any goon then just like pump it up to be like your gunner profile for the turn which yeah. i think is really interesting <clears throat> um and yeah it's a they really definitely cool mechanic for like how to use a gunner in a team they definitely feel like a team that really needs to find ways to do a lot of chip damage so i think that's that's really where the skill is going to be if you can chip people down then you get your chooser of flesh to get a kill and then suddenly your man your night fiend now has three apl he charges fights kills a dude shoots someone else and now everyone that tries to react around him is now spooked that's just like that's just gotta uh, be terrifying does creeping shadow require you to be concealed or just in, it does. in shadow you gotta be concealed and within shadow so it's a lot of there's a lot of conditions it is an insane ability that means that on in the dark you probably won't get charged unless you want to be charged on turn two yeah i was more wondering if you could use it to shoot people and then get out of the way when they activate but no it doesn't appear that way because i don't think they have a single silent weapon do they no but you could slither out of sight. That's one of the other attack ploys. So after you like shoot someone, yes. you flip back to conceal, and then you yeah, can creep you get the little away. worm blade uh, pop back one. A little without bit, a little any bit. of the cool guns. <laughs> but you do have to be within shadow. So like again, if you're not within <laughs> shadow, the team doesn't do anything. So there are a lot of positional things that you are yes. committed to doing, and if you don't do them, the team is not good because it's like literally like half your ploys just don't do anything. Yeah. And and as we know, like like we we point out, in close quarters is probably their best, uh, you know, their best environment. But most objective markers kind of sit in the middle of a room, well yeah. well away from a wall. And it, at some point, your mandrakes are gonna have to move on to that, and you're gonna have to just take it and hope that it goes your way. Hope those four, those in that case, five up involved saves uh, come through for you. Yeah. There's definitely a, uh, they definitely feel way sketchier than they read because definitely when I read them through when we first got our review copies, I was like, wow, this team seems insane. But after playing with it, I'm like, now this team seems very hard to play and I am not worried about them. Oh, I maybe my concern was, uh, you know, I I don't do as much TAC op analysis as I should for teams that I don't play. See people being concerned with uh, what is the recon one to get to your is a courier. So someone yeah, they, could, uh, they have a really courier, easy scoring opportunities for sure. And using the primary, which we haven't even talked about, uh, Shadow Walk, is that what it's called? Uh, um, it was Shadow Passage, yes. The, the big Shadow ability Passage, that everyone was spooked about. about this. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, you can just be like, man, I'm getting rinsed. Uh, this is my courier, and he's going to teleport to the other side of the table, and there ain't jack shit you can do about it, unless your team is numerous enough to cover all the visibility angles of the board well, which the thing is it's not visibility it's full line of sight so like okay it, it's definitely manageable to actually stop shadow passage on most open boards by just having some goon in the back of the map yes. staring at the entire board yeah. on in the dark it's impossible like they're gonna shadow passage whenever they want but on open it's surprisingly easy like for a horde team there's never gonna be a mandrake in your back line if you just keep shadow passage in mind so i think that's like the big thing that everyone is worried about but it is an operative performs normal move, but instead of moving, you just teleport it somewhere else. It's got to be within shadow, which means that it either is underneath a vantage, within one inch of heavy, or within one inch of a shadow portal token, but it also cannot be in line of sight, which is the entire chart of like visibility, obscurity, and then your cover rules. So if you're just like teleporting behind a building, but someone is looking back and cuts the line where you get no cover, which is not that hard on most Octarius, but if you really think about how Octarius looks, if you teleport behind a wall, 
generally for a person like for a vet guard team or a 12 operative team that's moved up a little there's not a lot of places for you to teleport and even when yeah. me and jason were playing six marines it was hard for me to find a useful spot to land a teleport so Fair enough. it definitely reads like ah this seems crazy but if it was visibility it would be crazy but it happens to be line of sight which means that as long as you have a dude like you can kind of see the back edges it's not that bad and just keep in mind that if you they can't teleport they basically have to approach you fair and they're not that good approaching you fair yeah no. definitely another factor with like the line of sight thing is because like <clears throat> if people have a bunch of models on conceal their line of sight is you can walk all over them um but yeah you, know. you can really you can really push your opponent around if they start nine <laughs> operatives on conceal so they can do all this like tricky business because you're like all right well i'm just gonna run up to all the advantages stand on all the points be on engage yeah. and say it like you you don't do anything on turn one, which is which is fine. But then on turn two, the shooting is good, but it's not like it's not AP two shooting. It's just solid shooting where one dude will chip off some wounds, but he's not often going to just like rinse a dude. Yeah, the uh, whoever gets uh, is soul fire from the uh, abyssal will be in a in trouble. But yeah, everyone else is kind of they can reliably expect even even your guard mooks can reliably expect to at least require two activations to be shot to death. Right. By these yeah. guys. So like it they're they are they are very good. Like their rules all read like they get all these crazy rules, but at the end of the day, if you play against them and you think about their team as you play, you do have lots of ways to kind of stuff out some of the craziest things. And then they have to find a way to like create a realm of shadow. And I think that does feel very thematic because once the shadow is there in the middle of the board and they start like teleporting in behind the lines, then it's going to feel very spooky. Yeah, both of the teams definitely do feel very thematic and I'm very like satisfied with how much they have <clears throat> landed like in the in the pocket of they're uh sufficiently spooky vibes yeah when we when we, we were trying we didn't even uh get to play around with the ventrilocator i think we just mostly played like fair matches and it was just like <laughs> oh man this is this is hard for these boys with eight wounds and bolters to kill these marines yeah the uh the night lord guys are all fun i i think i mentioned in my review that the skin thief is absolutely what i wish the butcher was like the butcher the butcher goes to bed at night wishing he was the skin thief. And if if hopefully like uh, when we see changes uh, in three months, the teams, uh, hopefully we see some of the elite teams that are night lords obviously get get a little love. Um, I think you could take a lesson from this in terms of uh, you know, the butcher probably needs a fifth attack, if nothing else, and probably needs to hit on threes if we're being realistic here, because. I have not once ever played a game where the butcher did anything but die horribly, whether I played as him or played against him. He's, I want him to be good, but he, he just lets you down. And the skin thief is like, I, I, I'm there. I know what to do. I think the skin thief is like the MVP of the nemesis claw. Um, like to me, it looks like pretty significantly by far, like the best model on the team. Yeah. He was pretty gross when we played just being able to like stop a dude within six inches who like saw you get flayed that's very powerful ability because the skin thief when he flays someone alive he picks someone else within six inches and says see this this is you next and that guy can't do pick up actions do mission actions or touch objective markers yeah is the gross. crimson duelist uh the crimson yeah, duelist does better, that I think, right? it, um so i think it's like the same thing <clears throat> like pretty much exactly maybe it has a bigger range but um the crimson duelist does the same thing um but this is on on a space marine um and he yeah. can fight twice and duplicity for murder lets you charge in the middle there um c could he theoretically charge kill someone make somebody not contest an objective duplicity for murder into someone else kill someone else and then make someone else also not count as a model because uh, if so i think that's charge. the centerpiece because duplicity for murder gets lets you get there. It's once per then, turning point. So, so it's once per no. turning point. It's still absolutely insane because no. like he can he can double kill plus like take somebody out of the fight. So <coughs> that's yeah. Like, I guess on that topic, let's, efficiency. we can we can uh, we can zoom back over to the the night lords a little bit. We talked a lot about a mandrakes and you know I think they'll be a very hot topic one and maybe night lords will kind of like fly under the radar for most people. But night lords I think actually crazy strong. You know, we're talking about proclivity for murder right now. That's one of their tack ploys. That basically lets you kill a dude and then charge again for three inches. It's like which a is effectively just consolidate. Aggression. Yep. Because you have to pay a CP and you can only do it once, but still very good. 
in most against most opponents, they're not going to give. Like when people take perpetual aggression as legionnaires, it's a, a decent opponent's not going to give you a, just a bunch of lineup shots. So you only really need that one tack ploy for that one guy who's going to get the bounce. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing is this is way less telegraph than. Yeah, and, uh, I, perpetual hey, aggression. Guys, perpetual aggression you call it at the beginning of the turn, your opponent's like, "Oh, sh- I gotta like, I gotta pay attention for the whole turn." But this one, just like the Felgor, the moment you make one mistake somewhere, your opponent's like, "Ah, I gotcha," and jumps in your line. You're like, "Oh no, there's a giant space marine who just told someone else that he's gonna flay them, and now he's chain staring another dude who cannot run away." Doesn't the skin thief get a damage reduction too? Yes, he does. He gets the damage reduction to too. I think too. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just coming in with the grossness. He's going to be just ultra tanky. He's like the anointed plus the butcher plus the hand of the archive the crimson duelist put all into yeah, one. Yeah, the flare. <clears throat> and then like yeah, the, the night lord. Yeah, the skin thief is crazy. Um, you could give him the the grizzly trophy to give people minus one attacks, and now he's just even crazy tankier. Um, I feel like that. I don't know. That's it's a really good. I don't combo, know. We were talking about overkill. doom guys. This this is like the team that's giving you another Doom guy because you can stack all. Well, let's go let's go through some of the equipment, Jason. You know, for for the Night Lords, you've got Flayed Skin, which is no rerolls within three for two. You've got Grizzly Trophy, which is exactly the same as Legionnaires, which is kind of boring, but also not surprising that it would show it back works. up here. What was that? It works. It it, it, it works. It's great. It's excellent. Wild. Everybody loves it. Uh, we've got Chain Snare, which is if your opponent tries to fall back on a four up, they can't. Which is also very good when you you're injure them well, you get a plus one yeah uh suspensor system boring we don't care about that combat blade fine not as good as the malefic blade obviously because malefic blade is insane uh it's just four attacks on threes three five then a frag grenade and a crack grenade but you could theoretically put six equipment points on the skin thief and just watch him just wreck shop because he's got chain snares grizzly trophies and flayed skin like if you don't shoot him you can't kill him and if he's touching a dude and he's chain snared two guys so Can't get rid of the Grizzly Trophy, I don't remember wh- where the wording is, but somewhere in there, there's a rule that you can't have the Grizzly Trophy and the Flayed Skin. Oh, correct, correct. It does say that on Grizzly Trophy. It says not available for Optima Flayed Skin. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. do- no Doom guy just covered in skin. Right. Because uh, it totally is. I mean, the Skin Thief is already the Doom guy of the team. He's just going to be going nuts. He's going to be doing all the work. He's going to be running all the errands. So I think it. it- is it with um, the Legionnaires? Because you do, if, if you're a Legionnaires player, this team will cut. It's this team is Legionnaires of Night Lord's characteristics, is basically kind of how it is. The, the raw stats of your team are the same. Uh, since you don't get the marks of chaos, you do give up durability, whether it's not having any invuln saves across the whole team. Plasma and Melta will eat your lunch. And if you. If you're not watching out for that, you could be real trouble. This is kind of like a uh, uh, Kasserkins have always kind of liked fighting into elites, and that would be a team that would definitely love to probably go into Night Lords because they can uh, melt the opposing operatives pretty easily. Um, there is there's also other trade offs like uh, the Visionary, your leader, for example, has to actually make a trade off when it comes to his melee weapon and pistol choice. Which is something I like when Games Workshop does this, where they're like, you can either have the best pistol option and the crappy melee option, you can have the best melee option and the crappiest ranged option, or you can have like this kind of middle ground. And so, in the case of the Visionary, he does have to. He, he all his melee choices are decent, but the plasma pistol does come with the worst uh, yeah, it melee comes with option. The Nostrum and Chain Blade, which is five attacks on twos, four or five rending, which is respectable not, not incredible it's but not it's bad. respectable but it's no uh it's no demon blade, uh, it's no demon blade from, but he does come no. with the portent ability so when he has the prescience tokens he can at least like if your opponent doesn't roll well he's like well you rolled two dice you rolled one get red <laughs> kid and just like shreks them mm-hmm. yeah um and i'm pretty sure his plasma pistol hits on twos doesn't it or it does um and then uh he's also a little bit less efficient with the ploys where the legionary just gives you a free strat ploy, and then um, his is you have to spend an action and a prescience token to get your command point back. And this team does feel very, very CP hungry in comparison to legionary. Legionary, because you get the free ploys, it kind of like, well, I'll spend like two strat ploys and maybe I'll do attack ploy from time to time. But this one, you definitely feel the crunch a little bit just because the APL is so much more important. Yes, and a Vox Scream goes up one CP. Every, every time, time you use it, use it too. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Uh, God forbid you have to use it a third time because I don't know where you're going to find that CP. I hope you haven't been using any of it up to that point. So yeah, it's the way I look at them compared to Legionnaires is you're, you, you're losing a little bit, bit of durability and you're probably losing a bit of lethality because as you mentioned with Mandrakes, there's not a lot of rerolls with them and the Night Lords are kind of in the same position. Uh, the Skin Thieves is a perfect example. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have Relentless or Ceaseless on his weapon. Uh, something at least the the butcher gets uh, doesn't make up for the fact that he's kind of terrible. But if the skin thief did have relentless, uh, he'd be he be he still has the broken. opportunity to screw you on dice, I guess. And since yeah. you're wanting to keep your CP in the bank for your really good ploys like proclivity for murder and uh, Vox scream, when you when you when the dice come up bad, which they will, because it's kill team you're going to have face a hard choice on uh, man. Do I really want to do command point rerolls? Yeah, it's definitely a very, I think the night Lords feel like a pretty tightly designed team. They just feel very powerful. I think as a result, because they get to be good elites, but they also get to have more activations than most elite teams. And one of the cool things about Prescience tokens is there's no comment about them discarding at the end of a turning point. So theoretically, if you played super cagey, you could just like wait six activations at the beginning of turn two and just chill and watch your opponent play their entire turn and then just jump them. Yeah, Which, the, uh, you know, the visionaries, likely, but hilarious. The visionaries ability is fantastic. Um, the fact that it's a D three generation, I think, is going to break people's hearts because. You're going to find yourself in a turn where you're like, man, I need more than one prescience token or whatever. And uh, it's going to come up a one and you're going to, you're going to be in a bad spot. Like there's a huge difference between one and three on that die. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. I, I suspect they'll be very good. This is definitely one of those things where like, if the team feels a little weak, they could just be like, well, what about D3 plus one? Does that help? And it's basically like a <laughs> yeah. guarantee of four extra activations over the course of a game. So like, if they like they don't need to add operatives or any of this other stuff to balance this team if it <clears throat> turns out that they were too strong or too weak they have a lot of levers that they can like just touch this one thing and see what happens yeah and they i had they had the complaint in my review there are uh, a few abilities they have that kind of feel they're pretty low uh, compared to other stuff but even when we compare this against uh past teams uh, if, if we had to do a percentage of uh, useful abilities to non-useful or less useful abilities, they're still like in the 80 to 90% plus range. Uh, and, and historically, when you look at some of the kill teams, uh, you know, I play Wormblade all the time, and they, I got more than a few ploys that almost never get used. And so in that regard, Mandrakes and Nightlords are still way above average. Uh, yeah, I you're mean, gonna find you know, something for this stuff. Night Lords have basically the funniest possible ploy, which is basically screw Imperium specifically. Which <laughs> no other team has in the game from what I remember. Like I don't I don't even think in Compendium there's like a thing that's like I hate one faction specifically. Not even like Death Watch has anything, right? Not that I recall. We might be wrong. If we're wrong, you know, message us on the Discord or let us know in the comments. Um, yeah, I would have to look it up. I could have swore there was like a a fuck chaos one somewhere in there, but at this point, I can't yeah, remember. Like, there's like psych out grenades on custodies, but death to the false emperor is a night lord ploy. You use this tag ploy after rolling all of your attack dice against the Imperium keyword, and you can re roll, I think, one die. But if it's against an Astarte specifically, you just you just re roll everything, you just get relentless. Yeah, so just it's like, get oh, relentless. I made a little oopsie and was like, okay, well, against not not even like not even like half the teams in the game, you get you get like one reroll, but then against specifically Space Marines, you just say, screw you guys, you punch them again, which is hilarious because it, it like, there are no other teams with this design space, and I just assumed that we weren't going to carry this in, but here it is, Death of the False Emperor. It'd be kind of funny if they were like, oh, but they're going to struggle against intercession, and they're like, Death to the False Emperor. I mean, that might be what it's there for, honestly. Like, in testing, like, wow, intercession's really hard. I like, would we'll have what? a hard time imagining intercession having a hard time against Nemesis Claw because they just have like multiple AP. <clears throat> like, I think yeah, I think they just like hit harder and and get there safer. Yeah, I mean they have the Melta and the plasma pistol, and they can do it all. Wait, did you, you know. mean that uh, you you think intercession will be good against Nemesis Claw, or the other way around? I, I think the other way around. I think Nemesis Claw is going to slap around the other elites. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Decently. Like yeah. I. There's yeah, just just like imagine <clears throat> imagine turn two your opponent 
as the Night Lord has now saved up, you know, anywhere from one to four, one to six Prescience tokens. You're playing the Intercessor and you're like, I guess I'll play four activations in a row before you go. And you're like, yeah, you sure will. You just watch them play half a turn and then you just jump them with your AP2 guns. Like, what, what, what are you supposed to do in that situation? And then, like, if they do have a good angle on you, you just Vox Scream and then Plasma Pistol them? Yikes. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I think they've got the tools to do all, all, the, all the fun tricks. They're, I, one big complaint that I have on the pair of teams, actually, is archetypes. I don't really understand what the point of having archetypes are if we're just going to give three archetypes to every team. Because both of these teams have Infiltration, Recon, and Seek and Destroy. Like, I don't really get the point of having them if we're just going to give them to everyone. And that's one of my complaints about the box. I love the box, actually, and I think the narrative rules are good, the rules for Beta Decima are good, the pair of teams are good, the sculpts are great, but on balance, I'm like, what is the point of the archetypes if we're going to give them out this way? I don't know, how do you guys feel about it? I think you got a good point, Travis. I, I, it does kind of beg the question of, at this point... D- would the game be better if everyone just gets all the archetypes or are certain teams just going to like launch out of their kind of like out of the, like whatever is hindering them. Thanks to their attack ops. I, uh, at this point, I don't know if I could make a determination on it, but if I was part of like the rules balance team or play testing team, that would be something that would be worth exploring. Uh, I tend to think like if a team is, if a team is good, it's tack ops are usually not what are making it's good making it's good as the rules that are inherent to the team and if if you're if you're a strong player and you know how to play the game you're probably going to be have a handle on primaries anyway and uh i've seen i've seen everyone use all the tack ops effectively like i hell i just played against uh, security based teams at adepticon and they uh they did just fine even though i remember when the the decks came out, we were all kind of under the impression that security was one of the weaker ones, but uh, if Adepticon's anything to go by, that is not the case. Yeah, because, like, Hyrotech was doing security, um, VetGuard only has security. Yeah, security was the best in the first, like, third of the game for a good reason, because you could score it on turn one. Now, if you just take a seat back, don't go, like, balls of the wall, blowing up operatives and trading off pieces super early, you can still play the same security game and just play the whole game, which is what you're supposed to do with security. So to me, it just feels kind of weird. Like I felt like at the beginning of the game, teams were somewhat balanced around which archetypes they were allowed access to. For example, if Pathfinders got Seek and Destroy, it would have been pretty nice for me to just sit back and like blow people up while sitting in my dro- drop zone for secu- <laughs> like for security or Seek and Destroy. I wasn't allowed to, and I was like, that's fine. I got to run up and die. That's part of the balance of my team. But now we're getting over to newer teams that are getting released with like, oh, we'll just take three of the archetypes like why not like what's the point then why why do why do these older teams have these restrictions um so yeah that's like my big complaint here like i feel like they could have just been seek and destroy infiltration or recon infiltration it would have been fine but i think in terms of like four players having the backup of seek and destroy is a very nice fail safe for like oh i don't know how to play the team i guess i'll just play seek and destroy right so that's kind of where it's coming from probably because it just lets the game play easier but from a balancing perspective i think you lose a little bit when you just give everybody everything because i I think it's an agreement makes the game more interesting imagine if wormblade could play security you just like sit back watch the midline just like blow people up is like you send a single dork to go stand on the midline you're like yeah i'll sit in my back line go deal with that guy or lose yeah and i think that's uh that's something that like when you play a certain tack ops it never really occur- occurs to you i think uh, adepticon this time around was the first time i really got to play against people who play that security mindset because we just don't have a lot a lot of vet guard players uh we i mean we got some people who play higher tech a lot but you know for the longest time they thought recon was the way to go and you know it's kind of it's kind of shown if you've got a nice open board especially that allows you to just kind of be like uh, make my day uh I'll, I'll i'll wait to turning point for kind of attitude uh, those security security ones can go a lot further than i would have given them for but that's because i've been playing infiltrate and seek and destroy for like two goddamn years now <laughs> i'm yeah, used there's to being definitely aggressive. like a different scoring cadence that comes with different archetype decks 
And I think security is one of those ones that kind of sneaks up on players who aren't used to playing against good security. Because you can get four points from nowhere, basically, at the end of the game. You're like, wait, would I just lose? You're like, yeah, you, I, I, you did just lose. Because you like, they get center line, central control, and seize ground like twice and then seize ground fully at the end of the game you're like oh no i just lost four points because you're like you calculate a lot of people calculate like turn by turn but they're not thinking about like oh what's the actual game state going to be like at the end and security can just come out of nowhere especially on a team like higher tech which took adepticon you know shane did a great job where you can kind of guarantee that you're going to have like five operatives at the end of the game if you're playing pretty cagey but yeah, I don't know. I'm excited. I think the sculpts look really good. Jason, you've been you've been poking around with your Night Lords, how they coming along? I've got them all put together. Um, and I'm assuming you all can tell I've been sick. So I have added like an extra like 10 hours of sleep in my last couple days. Um, yeah, they're, they're totally built. Um, they're cool. I'm excited. Uh, I, I realized I don't have uh, a proper blue. I just have like a Latok blue and McCrag or whatever, like the general uh, Ultramarines is. So I'm like, I'm gonna go scoop up some darker, like the Night Lords blue. Um, what? What about you, JD? Did you get to play around with any of the product in this release? No, uh, I. There's no one. There's no one around me that is. Uh, I'm allowed to tell <laughs> the rules to to play with. So I'd have to go to Tabletop Simulator if I want to do that. And I've been a. I've kind of been a staunch, like, uh, I want to play the physical game, and that just might be me being an old man who doesn't want to, like, actually learn how to play with tabletop simulators. So it's all theater of the mind for me. If nothing else, Jason, I can uh, at least uh, tell you how I painted my Shrive Talon because he's a, he's a night lord. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's a fun little scheme. <laughs> did, you go with the, did you go with the normal? Or, like, I mean, what did you... Did... Uh, I He's a... Uh, like five different uh types of blue with a uh, little lightning bolt on his armor and uh your standard like uh retributor armor gold trim guy but uh, uh he's got flayed skin on him and he, he's a fun little guy to do i could i i could see uh painting a team like that i my my 40k team is ultramarine so i'm not i've done plenty of blue so in that re- in that respect nemesis claw doesn't isn't really high on my painting list. Uh, I'm definitely uh, excited to get the uh, the next Gene Stealer team painted, though. Oh yeah, you would be filthy Gene Stealer player out here rubbing his claws. You got oh, a yeah. head start too. Rub- Man, my mandibles are um, salivating. Man- your mandibles oh. are clicking out there in the <laughs> yeah. background. He posted a picture. He posted a picture in like the Goonhammer like writers chat with his like his patriarch just in the background. He's like, I found the model. I was like, of course you did. It does look really, it's a really, really cool model. So yeah, I'm excited to see how it comes out. It's a fantastic, uh, it's one of those ones that I was only going to paint as a display piece for kind of like a diorama for them. And then when I saw, I, I was like, I can't believe they're going to put this model in the goddamn game. It was bad <laughs> enough. We got custodians running around this table, but you're going to put what, what is kind of like really like stretching the, the kill team uh, boundaries in terms of its scale. Yeah, because like his claws are like four inches wide. I mean, like I haven't seen that model in a while, um, but it's, I'm pretty sure what was it on a 50 millimeter base. Yes, uh, the, the the question will be: uh, Will will he be on 54 kill team or not? Well, we won't know until we see the actual rules because uh, the Blades of Cain got their they came with a uh, certain base sizes, but I want to say in the rules it changed it. I can't remember what it changed it to and what they came as, but there was a a shift in base size and the patriarch in the brood coven box is on a 40 millimeter, but I want to say he's yeah on a 50 for 40 K something along those lines. So we'll see what he ends up on. And I would be a, you know, I'd be remiss if we don't at least take a pass on these swimming rules. Did you take a look at the extra rules for the narrative? I for nightmare. <laughs> okay. You are blowing my mind because I just thought John was like just bullshit and i you just I thought we were we had, yeah i just thought you guys were fucking vibing i don't know like i didn't catch it so yeah i uh fill me in on the swimming rules please yeah so yeah basically all the way like the i think the big thing that i wasn't expecting for this edition whereas for in the dark we all were thinking like oh what are they gonna do with the crazy space hulk maybe we're gonna have like uh you know eldari ruins smashed up against the imperial ruins and it was just like oh no it's just 
Imperial ruins the whole way through, whatever. Like, just the Space Hulk is just all Imperial shit, whatever. Which we were all, I, I don't think that's what we were expecting when we first saw the terrain, right? But come Beta Decima, the extra narrative terrain in this box makes this box humongous. You know, in our video review, the box is like two times bigger than the Salvation box. And it's basically taken up by a piece of the tray that's literally half a board that just sits in the water that extends your play space. But the rules also for Beta Decima Nightmare add in swimming, where you can jump into the water and swim around the map. So it basically turns all the water parts into playable play space. And if you're in the water, you're in cover, but you cannot make shooting attacks. Can you fight in the water? It doesn't say anything about not being able to fight. So I do think that you can have a water duel. And honestly, okay, I, having a, a knife fight while swimming does sound like a nightmare. I I tried to imagine Nemesis Claw Space Marines clad in fucking power armor swimming swimming through the water. <laughs> while, while knifing a dude. Shish kebabbing people on the lightning claws. Do, do they get floaties? Is that is that how like I'm supposed to imagine this? Uh, water wings the for floaties your skin? are made people. out of skin? They yeah, take, exactly. They take their armor off very quickly, wear the black carapace, and then go for a light jog. Yeah, he uh, fashions a water bladder out of his opponent's stomach and is it to and get himself. It's he just strong enough to it. float his power armor. Yeah, and you can dive from uh, platforms into the water. So it basically turns all of the maps on Beta Decima into basically like maps where melee teams always can get cover. Does it slow you down at all? It does not slow you down. But look, to be fair, these rules are attached with like a bunch of bonus rules like whirlpools and currents and okay, hypnotic cool. waters and ocean predators. So like that's what these rules are made for. But I think just turning the open area into usable terrain, I think actually does a lot to fix some of the boring parts of Beta Decima. Because now you have jumpable areas, swimmable areas, and now you can like swim over to gantries, climb up from underneath them and then like shank someone, which I think would be cool. Here's an interaction I didn't think about. Can you climb out of the water onto a platform, or do you have to get on the ground and then climb to a platform? No, because you can always yeah. walk through the floors because they are accessible. Off. You can phase through uh, floors. Gantry floors are accessible. You know, that, that would be interesting to see that as a main rule for the kill zone. I, you bring it up kind of points out that there is a whole narrative part of kill team that doesn't really get talked about nearly as much, but it is... I it's one of those I don't have the time to run a campaign uh, for it, and if just hopefully someday someone I know does it, because I'd be more I'd be more than willing to jump into it from a narrative aspect. Yeah, I think that it's to me it feels like oh this was like a nice little add on that increased play space that fixes like the biggest complaint that melee people have with Beta Decima of like oh look these long boards are literally unplayable because I just have two avenues I run down I have no cover I just get shot. Whereas, like, if you can swim, you can, like, swim around through the middle, climb up onto the objectives, and, like, you get shot because people are, have vantage into the water, but, like, that's fine. That's actually, like, you know, a trade-off compared to just walking out on dry land and dying. So, yeah, and there's obviously this, the shot tray is just never going to see competitive play because it's locked away in this narrative box, which is probably going to be sold out instantaneously. And that means that there's only going to be that many copies, and that's all the world will ever see. Well, you know, uh, people who are people are probably willing to give up that piece of terrain if all they're wanting is the team. So, if nothing else, if you if you want it bad enough, it's probably not that hard to get your hands on it. Yeah, it is a pretty big piece of uh, chalky plastic. Takes up a ton of the space in the box, and uh, I do think it actually looks pretty fun. Like it can hold. Tons of operatives. There's plenty of heavy cover. So there's like a thing where you can like run around on it, which is which I think is cool. And if you really wanted a like unique narrative experience, you could just like get two of them, put them both on the water, and just have people like play in the matrix and have a shooting hallway. Bring the uh, in the dark back into the open. Anyways, how are things? Or I guess uh, you know, is there anything else you want to chat about before we head out? You know, the local scene, the local hangs. I guess Adepticon just came and went, and I'm sure that was really good for your local scene, the rail spitter ruffians, right? So, yeah, uh, I would love to talk about my local scene. Uh, so it's been a year since we talked uh, right after last Adepticon, I'm pretty sure. Uh, at the time, I had gone up with a couple guys, and I would say the number of people from my local scene that went to Adepticon basically doubled this time around. Uh, 
to boot, uh, Jason, I think you played some of our guys, uh, Brett and Brayden, who were uh, there. They managed to go undefeated in the team tournament, uh, which I was very happy to see. We are talking about like, Brett and Brayden are, this is only like their second Adepticon. So uh, to go from like, like just showing up a year ago to uh, winning like a big event like that is it's, it's really fun to see uh, when your local guys like uh, win their own acclaim like that. Uh, uh, also um, here in the Midwest and central Illinois specifically and uh, Chicago area, uh, Travis, you remember Rob, he was, he was at Adepticon and he is now running events for kill team out of the dice Jojo out of Chicago, which is a very, very popular game store. Their uh, Discord is very, uh, very heavily trafficked. I think they have a 24 person event coming up in two months and it like sold out in less than a week. So hopefully in the future, we will see maybe something like a GT level event from Rob. Uh, Joe Bell, who I'm sure you remember, is still running the Gateway Open out of St. Louis, uh, which is going to be a world of. Uh, uh, a, a championship qualifier event, one of the few ones we get here in the Midwest outside of Adepticon. Uh, and even in uh, Champaign and Urbana, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that town, but that's uh, it's it's another one of those uh, 100,000 person, you know, cities, air quotes, that kind of exists out here in central Illinois area. And they've got a new uh, kill team group that literally for their first uh, tournament have already got 16 out of 16 spots filled with over two weeks to go before the event even starts. So nice. things are really kind of starting to kick off here in the Midwest. And it's very nice to see. I love to hear that, man, especially because, yeah, you came, I think in June, I think somewhere after, I think you got like another second place Wormblade finish. So not just after Adepticon, but it's good to hear the growth because, you know, we've had Joe on, we've had Rob on, we've had you on twice now. So it's good to hear that things are popping off in the Midwest. Obviously, you know, Jason's out there doing his part also. Yep, we've got <clears throat> we've got um, the Icebreaker Renegade event coming up. Um, I think we if, if it didn't just happen, we're going to have the tickets out for that pretty soon. Uh, Jason, is this going to be a? I think you. I might ask you this at depth time. Is that going to be a qualifier event, or were you guys not able to get? Uh, um, we were not able to get that into a qualifier. Um, yeah, that, that would probably help a lot with attendance if we can pull that <laughs> off for the next one. Well, all right. Yeah, I mean that's uh great to hear all about all of that. Hopefully, people in the Midwest can check up the socials. You know, we'll drop your Discord and all the other stuff in there, and <laughs> make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Any other final thoughts about? Kill Team Nightmare, any of the, the big news basically from this weekend? I think we went over a little bit about our favorite optives, the Skin Thief, the Night, the night Fiend, and all the crazy shenanigans you could do, along with the swimming rules, the crazy swimming rules, <laughs> which JD thought I was just memeing about for the last like three I, days. I, I just thought it was like uh, you guys just fucking around. So that's, that's cute. <laughs> I, uh, I will say, I guess we've kind of beat uh, Nightmare to death. Uh, I really am excited for the future of the game at this point. Uh, I could use that balance data slate uh, a week prior to when it came out, but uh, it's still it's still all the changes I wanted to see. Um, I'm hard pressed at this point to think of anything that absolutely needs change. I do think higher tech are probably going to be the dominant team going forward, but not in the same way that we maybe have seen from things like Chaos Cultus and Felgor. So. If anything, the curve is getting flattened, and I think that's what we all kind of want to see. You, you kind of want to walk up to a table and look at the team across from you and think that your opponent has a chance and just not walk and be like, oh, you brought this team. I roll. Like That's that's what we want to get away from, and I think we get a bit closer there every time. These two teams, while good, I don't think will break the game's backbone, and uh, I'm really ready for uh, what's the next one? Termination? Termination. Termination. Uh, yeah, we're going to get yeah, yeah. some slightly faster short kings and a whole <laughs> gaggle of brothers. Yeah. Uh, I, I want those rules. I, I want to see them now. <laughs> and uh, I guess the final shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, uh, Alvara. Thanks for joining, man. <laughs> if you made it all the way to the end of the podcast. Thank you for helping to support us and all of our other Patreon supporters. 
Yes. And uh, listeners, um, if you haven't already joined the Discord and or left us a five star review on whatever platform you're listening on and or checked out the Discord, we're going to have links for that all in the episode description. Mm-hmm.